ready to get started? Maybe. Awesome. Well, welcome. Uh, it's a privilege to be here on behalf of our amazing development teams in Seattle and in Alaska uh, to represent a very special project called Never Alone. Um, it's so good to see a few friendly faces in the crowd, um, and I'm happy to be here spending time uh, with you today to uh, describe uh, quite a special project that we've been on for the last two and a half years. Quick show of hands, uh, how many of you have heard of Never Alone? Amazing, okay, this is gonna go great. Uh, how many of you have played the game? All right. How many of you finished the game? All right. Okay, good. We're doing good. Um, we've been learning uh, a whole new way of making games and have uh, experienced a depth of purpose of game development that uh, none of us ever thought was possible. Um, so it's incredibly exciting to be here among peers to share a little bit about that experience. I recognize that everyone's very busy today. Um, there are a lot of amazing talks going on. Uh, so I'm going to give a quick overview of what we're going to be focusing on today. Um, we're going to introduce Never Alone and the people who inspired uh, the creation of the game. We're going to focus on the game's visual style. I have a very special guest here today who's going to take the bulk of the talk. Uh, we're going to discuss how we tr achieved true infusion of a culture in a game and discuss the impact that the game has had uh, around the world. Uh, my name is Sean Vesey. Uh, I'm the creative director on the project. If you had told me at any point over the last 20 years while I was working on uh, games about blowing shit up, uh, I would have told you that someday I'd have the opportunity to do something that I love to do, make games, but make games that have lasting, meaningful impact. Uh, I would have told you you were crazy. Uh, so it's a bit surreal for me to be here talking about the adventure we've been on. Um, I'm here today, and I'm happy that you to meet a colleague and a good friend of mine, Dima Veryovka, our art director. Hey, guys. Uh, Dima worked tirelessly uh, to appropriately represent the spirit of a people. Um, he and the rest of our team became students of their culture and traditions, um, and, and he managed to develop a truly signature visual style that's garnered a tremendous amount of attention uh, from players around the world. I'd also like to introduce you to, uh, virtually to a woman named Gloria O'Neill. Uh, she is the president and CEO of the Cooking Lit Tribal Council. Um, she and her leadership team uh, uh, should be credited with the original vision of uh, creating a game to share and extend her culture's mythology, values, and worldviews. Um, and she challenged us uh, to make a game that would catalyze the curiosity of a modern gaming audience to develop a hunger to learn about world culture. And that's, the, that's what we set off to do two and a half years ago. We're members of Eline uh, and a, a newly formed company called Upper One Games. Uh, we develop games for evolving minds. Um, we believe that games can offer curious gamers eager to expand their worldview, uh, fun, entertaining experiences. Uh, and the kinds of games that we want to make require being adept at forging lasting partnerships. These are a few of the groups, the foundations, and organizations who we work with on a regular basis. Uh, folks like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, the Public Broadcasting System, uh, the Smithsonian. Um, but one of the deepest and most meaningful partnerships um, that we forged uh, recently is with the Cook Inlet Tribal Council, who, who uh, introduced us to over 40 Alaska Native elders, storytellers, artists, and social entrepreneurs. These people are featured in the game through cultural insights. You get to hear uh, from their voice aspects of their culture that are contextually relevant to the gameplay that gamers play. Um, these ambassadors gave us their time their experience and their wisdom, and most importantly, their trust. Um, and we took that trust very seriously. It was a serious responsibility that we felt uh, that we had as game developers to uphold uh, their values and to create a game that would make their community proud. Um, and we're tremendously grateful for the opportunity to have such wonderful creative collaborators. Um, I'm going to play a quick uh, trailer for those of you who may not have seen it to get a, a sense for um, kind of what we were after in making the game.
So many of you may not know this, but the game's fiction is based on an Inupiaq legend uh, called Kunuk Sayuka. Um, it was passed down for generations and told to us through uh, the living, oldest living relative of a man named Robert Nasser Cleveland. He's the man pictured here. He was a, uh, a master storyteller who uh, died in the 70s. But he, he passed down the story of an endless blizzard and a young protagonist who goes out in the world to find the source of the blizzard and ends up being challenged uh, to restore uh, balance to nature. Uh, the game explores the theme of interdependence. Um, it's a central value of the Inupiaq. Uh, and it's explored through the two main characters of the Inupiaq girl and, and her unlikely companion, an Arctic fox. Each have respective skills and abilities that they have to work together to overcome obstacles. At this point, I want to turn it over to Dima, who's going to discuss the uh, visual style of the game. Thank you, Sean. I'm happy to be here, guys. And <clears throat> before I start to talk about the visual style, I would like to kind of go a little bit and tell... Uh, about my background. So I've been in the industry more than 15 years now, working on different kind of games uh, for various platforms, but I've never been part of such an amazing pro project as Never Alone. It's truly a creative project. Uh, my background, I'm a traditional artist, and uh, to find a project like that, it's really, really something special. Um, I grew up in Odessa, Ukraine, which is like a beautiful place on the Black Sea. Um, I graduated from St. Petersburg Academy of Art uh, with a master's degree in fine art and architecture design. Early days of my career, I started to work like a uh, game designer, sculpting toys for uh, various clients. One of them, like lots of them, it's like, it was Disney. I worked with uh, Hasbro, Mattel, and many more. And I come to realization if I can do it in clay, why I can do it like actually on a computer. And I learned the computer and the uh, first job was at Zipper Interactive. It's, back then it was a small company. And uh, I've been a key member and key, I, st I started like working as a character artist and become like a lead artist, running a bigger team there. Work on the titles like Socom, the entire Socom uh, series, Mac, Unit 13. And uh, now I'm happy where I am. I'm working at Eli Media, working on the games like Never Alone, culture games. So let's talk about the visual style now. What is important? Like any new, any new project you start, you need to be inspired first. Like you really need to know what you want to talk about. So you need to set some goals. In our case, it's probably everyone wants to make your game really like beautiful, special, to find like some kind of a special, unique look that stands out from the slew of games coming out every year. But most important thing, because this game is about people, about certain culture, this visual style needs to reflect the culture, needs to reflect the people, needs to reflect what, they, what their motivation is, what their values. And uh, the other thing is important to kind of capture the beauty of the place where they live. And kind of more, the, other one, the third one is like universal, but like any visual design you do, they need to support the actual design of the game and to support and extend the gameplay experience. But first, before saying like how you want to really to create the game, what you really want it, like what you want it to put there, you need to figure out who first, and then figure out how to do that. Because lots of people, including me back then and uh, when I worked in other companies, just you thinking how to create the shader, the, some kind of a special uh, subsurface scattering, hair and stuff, like, but you're really not thinking why you're doing all that. It might be not necessary, what kind of message you wanted to deliver. And to, to us, because the message is about the culture, you really need to go and study who these people are. So I'm going to give you like really basic information, something that you probably can find on, on, online, and that's important to understand who these people are. They live in Inupiaq, it's Inupiaq people, in Inupiaq culture, and they live all the way up north in Alaska, at the very, very top, and uh, it's total like around 12,000 people live up there, live in a harsh environment, like average temperature 
in the winter minus 21 degree. It's like, it's not that it's average. That means sometimes it's minus 50. First time we went there, it was minus 35, and it's cold. Like, <laughs> I, I live like in St. Petersburg, I never experienced that cold ever. So like, it's like minus 35, you don't know what to do. It's like five minutes outside, you, you don't you wanna go inside. But uh, how these people live, they, they still practicing like subsistence living. So they hunt, and uh, it's two, diff two different groups. Like one of them live on a coastal, the other people live like inland. And uh, based on where they, they live, they, people from coastal, they live, they harvest seals, whales, all sorts of uh, sea animals. And people from inland, they harvest uh, caribou, different type of birds. What very special about these people that we kind of like notice, and that's something that we, we wanted to put in the game and translate that. These people incredibly warm. Like they, they like, because even though they live there, their hospitality, they, every time we come there, they, they just like invite us to their houses and uh, willing to share their, their wisdom with us, willing to tell their stories. So for us, it's like, it becomes like almost our family. And uh, also, like, these people have very rich and incredible tradition of storytelling. That's something, like, we're like, okay, that's worth to tell. That's worth to, like, share the stories. I jump here, but, like, I will say, like, that's the Barrow. Barrow is, like, the, the, that's the first place when we went there. It's Barrow, Alaska. That's where we went. It's, like, the most northern place in Alaska. It's, like, 5,000 people live there. We take, like, you can imagine, that's where Seattle, that's where we travel from, all the way up there. Like, when people saying, how, when you go again into to Alaska, I'm saying, like, it's not just Alaska, it's to Barrow. And it's very necessary to pull out your phone and to show where it is. Because we went to Alaska 12 times, we went to Barrow three times, and it's a special experience. We went first time um, in the winter, and it was dark, it all, like, the whole day dark. It was a window, like, maybe two hours when the sun rises, and then you go into the, we went to pizza, and then like another hour and the sun goes down. You're like, okay, that's it. That's it. <laughs> something that you can't experience anywhere else. And then we went in May. That's the picture I took, like, that's one picture. It's 2 p.m. and the other one is 2 a.m. It's like light all day. It's like stepping it's, off it's, uh, under the planet Hoth. Exactly. It's, like, it, it's just like you, you're in a different world. What we did over there, so we, we met with elders, first of all. Elders, is a huge respect there for elders. And uh, people like, we, the, the image that you see here is like uh, Sean talking to Minnie Gray. She's one of the daughters of uh, Robert, Robert Cleveland. He is the storyteller. And um, what we did there, we would talk to them, we kind of trying to get like what the essence we wanted, to, like what's important about the culture. Because what's on the surface, everybody understands. Yeah, they hunt, they do certain things, but for us it wasn't a goal. We really wanted to share something special, something that they potentially can lose. And that's their spirituality. And uh, we also talked to kids, because to kids, like talking to kids is always fun. You're asking them, like, what's your favorite story? Tell us the story that you really like. Because we were looking what to find the right story, story that we can tell in the game. And kids told us lots and lots of stories that help us to kind of understand what is important to them, what is the character there. Like, for example, one of the characters, like little people, that came straight from them. Like, we were asking, like, what's, what, what do you want to talk? Like, tell us, like, the character that you want, like, like, what's the special kind of a character? And all of them, like, it's a little people. We'll be afraid of them. They live somewhere around us. It, it, it was interesting. So what also we did, we met with artists. I personally, I mean, because I'm artist and my background, like, I, I'm a sculptor. So to me, meeting the people that I, I, I was introduced to the Inupiaq art, to Inuit art, uh, way back when I was in academy, and I also carved in a soapstone to see actually and meet people who behind the scenes, so like to meet with them and talk, it was an amazing uh, experience. So that's uh, on this image, it's uh, 
John Huffley, really good artist. He showed me his latest, latest work, and we talk about overall what's important for him and kind of like he shared the, the ideas. That's all gave us the ideas, what we wanted to put in the game, what we wanted to translate in the game. We researched the art, and like if you look at the art, like just what stands out? Stands out like they have like very like original composition. They're using like unique materials, materials that only in that land like uh, ivory or baleen. They're mixing materials. But the most important thing, what actually stands out to me, is uh, the quality. The really like handcrafted quality every piece. Yeah, they, like, you feel the love, you feel the warm hands of the people, of creators, the artists. And even though like, we're creating the game and it's digital, one of the big goals is like, to, to bring this quality into the game. We, want, we don't want a digital kind of like impress somebody, look how it's glowing, look at this effect. We really wanted to bring this love into the game. And uh, it was like one of the goals. We talked to the scientists, and the, the, that's Aaron Crowell, amazing guy. He's studied Alaska, Alaska and Alaskan people 20 years. And we were lucky. We went behind the scenes in the Smithsonian Museum in Anchorage. He showed us uh, different tools, explained us what, how people live to. It was very, very interesting. And we participated in a community event. Like, just by looking at this image, you're probably thinking, like, what is that? What's going on there? <laughs> It was, we were lucky, it's not happens every day, but we arrived by Sean and the same day they caught the whale. It was two o'clock in the morning, even though it's bright, that's how two o'clock in the morning looks like. But we were part of that, so we're pulling the whale with the community, 40 feet bowhead whale, and celebrating with them. It's like everyone there on the snow, kids, elders, everyone. It was very amazing. Like, I, I like if, I can talk one hour just about that because all my friends, they just, they, they're asking specifically that part. We try maktak. Maktak is a whale blubber. The way they cook it, they just throw it in the snow and they, it sits there for an hour and it's ready to eat. It was interesting too. So we got inspired. It was like all, all these trips gave us inspiration. That's something that I, I said at the very beginning. Inspiration. We got that. The next step, mood board. So we need to, like, I really like to, like, it's a lot of thousands, pictures, videos, so we put everything on the wall. It's a long wall. That's one of the examples how the wall looks like. And we look at that, what stands out, what is important, what we really wanted to tell, how, what's, like, the colors, right? The northern lights, something really special, it's need to be there. Uh, people wearing traditional clothing, for sure, yes. And clothing, like, it's all fur. And uh, animals, we, like art, the, the traditional art, all that need to be in the game. How to do that? Let's find out. So that's one of the first images I drew, but it's kind of a special image to me because that's the image that kind of gave us the direction. That's the image that connecting the real world and the spirit world. It's like surreal. It's not like how we did the, the spirits in the game, but this picture have the soul. Like, like the, the, it, it, it's something that we're like, okay, I wanted to make a game like that. So it was a very important one. The second one also, like it's desaturated, the water, because it's a lot of water there, how it looks like the boat, water, and for the contrast, the white fox. This image, I don't know how many people saw, but that's the image of... Uh, uh, Islo in the shape of whale. The reason why, because uh, Inupiaq people, they really believe everything alive, everything has a soul, and land has a soul, like and everything. And in this case, like I, we in, try, I try to imagine how, like if that's uh, uh, Islo, how they will move, and they not necessarily need to move like Islos because, like, they have a soul; they can move some kind of different. Also, the beautiful water of Arctic Ocean, you can't pass that. It's just like amazing colors. We have that in the game, too. And that's one of the first images when we start to draw. Just the idea of how the village looks like, what's in the village, what's like how, what, what the structure's there. 
We research two pigs, what kind of boats they have, and kind of the first understanding how to, to make the characters, what kind of style. So like, th that's important work, right? Like I show you five images and it's like, now I know what kind of game I wanted to make. Like it's, it's important to go through that process. So we, what we want to do, we want atmospheric to capture tundra, the space. We want a soft rendering. We want authentic colors. We're basically using the colors that's there from ice, from water, and handcrafted feel. The one like, like very important to me that I said, like, because this love needs to be translated into the game. That's important quality. That image we took in May, that's how Tundra looks like. Amazing, beautiful, atmospheric, moody. But wait, we're making the platform a game. Good luck to make the platform a game in that environment. <laughs> it's just really nothing there, right? Like, it's a no variety. You, 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 like, okay, what I'm going to do? What you really want, you want that. You want some kind of a, you want a, something to jump on, to jump off. You, where, how, how to get it? Like, what, like, it's ice, it's gray. So we were really lucky. We started to research the Inupiaq land and we, to find this place. It's called King Island. King Island is a fishing village. It's built on the steep slopes, like it's on, built, built on the island on the steep slopes. And it's just amazing. Look at, like, look at the structure. Looks really interesting. Something that I didn't see before. And it's perfect for platform. It's like a platform, right? Like you're like, yeah, we want to use this. That's, that's great. The other thing is, this trees, but the thing is, like, first when we start the project, everybody said, like, oh, it's no trees there. It's like it's too north, too far north, no trees. But actually, in Nupiak land, because it's so big, inland they have the area called an Anaktuvik Pass, and an Anaktuvik Pass actually they do have trees. That's the image of an Anaktuvik Pass. That's where it's located. It's between two River Anaktuvik and John uh, John River. The way actually our uh, story, to, like the, the person who translated the story, he is from Anaktuvik Pass. And uh, we were happy about that, so we can use branches as a platforms. And I slow, of course. Just look at this image. Like, isn't that inspirational? Just by looking at the image like that, somebody said, make a game about this. It's easy to make a beautiful game just by looking at the image like that. It's, uh, so many, it's colors coming out, it's atmosphere. Different shapes. For us, it's like a clay. You can build whatever. It's a sculpture in the water. And for designers, it's like they can do whatever they want. They can. It's like really good material to work with. So we found the locations, and we start the project kind of like, okay, we know where we go. We know what we want. We know kind of what kind of colors we wanted to do. And that's the image on top. Like that's uh, real images from... Uh, bearer, and below that's kind of uh, the image from the game, early image from the game. But like, the, important to have like kind of a palette. Like I don't want to, like when I give the like we're working and trying to figure out like the range of the colors. You not go and use like all the colors in the world. Like you really like that's my range. That's what I'm gonna use. So for Tundra, that was the range, and we start the process. So that's how the game looks like. Like at the very beginning, it just looked like that. Oh, uh, sorry. What's happened? Hang on one second. Sorry, guys. <laughs> we crashed. We, the system is awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Covered. So that's how we start. The game built in 3D. That's important. Like, it, we used Unity. We didn't know Unity. We started the project. It was two artists, me and a really good friend of mine, Casey McDonald. And we'd never... I mean, all my experience, 3D games. I don't know how to do 3D games. And we choose, okay, let's learn at least one thing, Unity. Let's not figure out how to do 2D games. So we use 3D. And that's how it looks. It's not bad from the beginning, but like how you can improve, what is, is important. First thing we did, like we did the vignetting. So I'll just go here and just show like what vignetting does. It's kind of framing the whole thing, and it's easier for you to, to look at, like, to see what's important, you're looking like at the characters and the character path. But like when you look at the background, like and the background, this kind of noise, 
uh, especially that the, the game that we're building, it's a 2D game. You're going from left to right, up and down. You can't really travel in depth. That there's too much of an information. You don't need to go there. It, it actually suggests you to go, but you can't kind of give you like a different vibe, the not the right vibe. So what we did would blur everything. We used like a depth of field, and that was one of the ideas to, to make a really soft rendering game. But it's also help you to focus on the character, focus on the path. And everything else is there, but now I don't need to go there. I don't know what's there. And the third one, very important in my opinion, is to highlight the path. I will go here and show you what the highlight, yeah. So highlight the path, critical. Because it kind of tells you, like, you go right, especially when it's ledges. I will show you more examples later on. But that's kind of fi finalized the look. So when we got that, that's the formula. That's the formula of Never Alone that I just showed you in five minutes. It's easy to explain to the artist. The only thing, we built the game. I do, like, my normal day. I do, like, five, ten paint drawers every day, just paint on top. Like, I grab the screens. If I see something that like not following the direction or some too much things going on in the background, distracting, I will just erase that, smooth it out, change it, and the artist put it in the game. But that's the process. Very, I, I think it's a simple one. So it's another palette that's a village palette, a little bit warmer, real images over there, and the game is done there. So like again, we set up the, the kind of range of colors, and that's the image from the game. Very important is composition. We were lucky because we have control of the uh, camera, we know where is the camera, where is the character gonna be. We really like said like, okay, I wanted to, I wanted this bridge. I wanted people to see it because it's about to collapse or collapsed already. You need to be there. I wanted to see, like, I, I want to compose the shots. And because the nature of the game, you can do that. That's huge. Um, Ice caves, another palette, one of my favorite. And like, you see, like, I, I explain you like. The path that we highlighted, if you look at the top of the uh, ice flows, it's highlighted. And how we highlight, we're not using, we actually, it's also important, we use only one light, directional light. Everything else is painted, painted in vertices, so we paint vertices. And that's the artist, they paint the, artists, they paint the vertices to, to tell you I can come out on the left or I can come out on the right. I can go in depth, I can go anywhere, I can just can do these two things. Frame the shot, another like it's a big. If something big about to happen, or we need to understand what to do, how to solve the puzzle. Frame it. Coastal village palette, also an interesting one because it's the whole palette is desaturated. It's very dark. The only thing is saturation comes from the uh, northern lights, very bright and green. So the, again, like it could be really dark, but look at the planks. We highlight the planks. It's not realistic, but it's a nice contrast to have in the image. That's the amazing creatures, that's amazing story, and this story I really want you to hear directly from the community. That's one of the examples of our culture insights. We have 40 minutes of culture insight. We actually recorded 40 hours of culture insights and we boiled down to only 40 minutes. But through the whole game, lots of you guys already played the game, we, we kind of like unlock culture insights. To me, it's like, it's really, really special uh, material. So I wanted to share specifically this story. When I was young, my mom, whenever the you know, lights came out, she just whistle. <laughs> Boy, they come alive. Just keep whistling, and that aurora will just like you know, you can almost hear it. And then she explained to me uh, a little bit later that those are children and children who've passed away when they were children. You don't want to draw them in too much, you know, is what she said, because then they could play football with your head play Eskimo football, and that's what they want to do. They're always playing, those children up there. Don't play out without your hood on. If you had, don't have your hood on, the Aurora person is going to come down and chop your head off and play ball with your head. 
It wasn't like they were trying to do bad, you know, or it was like a scary story or anything like that. It was just that's what that's how it was. That's what it was. Great story, right? I mean, <clears throat> I would like to talk now. Like, uh, let's go to the character development really quick. Uh, how we develop, develop characters. First, inspiration that comes from an UPA card and from the real people. On the right, you see the little girl wearing an UPA parka, traditional clothing made from the caribou. And on the, on the left, you see the art. It's traditional art. It's uh, uh, the sculpture and the graphics. So the whole process, because we wanted to represent the culture, not like to create some kind of a unique looking, beautiful girl, the goal or people that actually reflects the culture. And like, like if you're looking at the, the, the row in, this, in the middle, they kind of fit. It feels like it's from the same world. And that was the, the, the very important quality. Even the, when we present our thinking behind about our characters, that's how we present to the community. We're not just drew like this kind of looking goal like, like we want. We present it like that. And for them, it's like, First of all, it's interesting to see our thinking process. They're like, they, it's not like they even realize, but they're like, yes, that's what we like. They, we really like the characters like that. Because it's very subjective. I, I spent like 10 years working on the characters. It's, it depends what you do. Some people want this, other people want that. North Korea. Uh, so I worked like a uh, Sokam and was like uh, the girl from South Korea. And for them, it's, she's beautiful, but for Europeans, it's not. And it's like, it's a lot of different things going into that. But I want to talk, uh, so like it's the main characters, girl and uh, uh, folks. And uh, of what's important, like a uh, girl, she's like a brave girl going th on this journey, uh, fearless. And uh, Fox as a companion has like other qualities. Very cute and very fast, small, can get in a small places, playful. But it wasn't that easy for us to figure out why, first of all, like why we did the girl. Like lots of people said that, they, not like lots of people asking, and that was kind of a debate even internally. Because uh, why we're not making a boy, why boy is not the main character. And uh, we felt like because it's not a kind of violent game, it's a game about you to understand the world, tune to the world, to, to, to figure out what's around you. We, we felt like golf is the better character because like we don't have weapons, we're not fight, we're not doing anything kind of like fast and violent. But the other reason, so like it fits better for the for this kind of a game, and the other reason we feel like uh, girl characters, female characters, are very underrepresented in the game. So if they presented, they presented like in such a kind of stereotypical way that we really would like to change. Uh, third one, very personal. We all like Sean has two daughters. I have two daughters, but I never play games with my daughters because like all my experience before it was like shooting games, they have no interest to play games like that. And like we thought like if we'll make the game with a girl as a main protagonist, it's, it's a high chance. And actually, in fact, that's the first game I play with my daughter. We enjoy time together. So it's like, that's why. <laughs> and uh, the Fox, uh, it also wasn't that easy for us to decide because at the very beginning we said like, yeah, we do want to have a Fox, but to, when we show to the community members, like, that's the, the, that's a girl and that's a fox, they liked it, but some of them approached us and said, like, you know what? Here in Alaska, we're really teaching kids not to play with fox because they have rabies. And maybe you can change the character on something <laughs> else, like a dog, or maybe a wolf, or maybe an owl. And... Uh, I even did like this very, like image, you started kind of thinking how it's gonna look through like different variation, but it wasn't just images. We spent three months of the development redesigning the game, making the game with a bigger animal, with a wolf. It's kind of like we, 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 we had to change the design and we did it, but like still it's, we, we were not satisfied with the result. It was kind of feels like the goal becomes less important, the uh, other character, the wolf becomes like stronger, 
and more powerful, and that wasn't the goal. We wanted the goal to be more important. And we came back after present like the new design, present everything, but we said like we really feel the goal uh, and the Fox is a better combination. It's better to build, better to build like this warm feeling uh, between them. And that's what uh, we ask them for permission, and they say like, okay, you did the job. We see why what you're talking about, like, and, and they agree that we can leave the Fox in the game. So that's kind of my process of de uh, like concepting the characters. It's not like I did it before for other games, but for this one it was feels like re really natural. I drew all the images in black and white, just kind of a fast sketches to get the proportions and stuff. But the thing is, like, because of d like in that kind of style, it instantly start to look like it's indigenous kind of. A, Images. Lots of people mistake that they're saying like that some kind of indigenous artist did, or, or like a native artist. So that's why I'm kind of a little bit proud. I said like after two years and two and a half years of development, I didn't learn the Inupiaq language. I learned a couple words, but I learned how to draw in Inupiaq. So people don't even know. And uh, uh, I wanted to show you like this character. That's a bad guy. The guys who know like it's a manslayer, and um, like I said, like because people really warm there, like 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 they're, we wanted to like even the bad guys shouldn't be like really a monster or the, the kind of um, like he he's bad, he's chasing you, but like we don't want to make him like evil. So I have a feeling if I will sit with these guys around the fire, I would be able to kind of chat with him and he will <laughs> he will warm it up. So that's also kind of part of the design and. Um, uh, Besides just a normal characters, we have uh, supernatural characters. Characters that can shift from animals to people and from people to animals. So I want you to hear uh, from our writer, Ishmael Hope, uh, what the story, why, why that happens. Also, like I want to say, like tomorrow, Ishmael is going to be here. He's a great guy. He's a writer uh, in our game, and he's going to do the presentation um, at four o'clock, I believe, with Sean talking about the stories. And uh, let's. We're taught that there's no hierarchy. It's not everything else, and then man, you know, <laughs> humans on top, and they're separate from everything. We're taught that everything is, is equal and that all the animals have a human form or can be seen in a human form. And so they have just as much or more intelligence. You know, in fact, have a lot to teach people. And so that's how these transformations can happen. It's if the animal wants you to see it in its human form. There's a story where a man comes up to an ice hole and then there realizes there's, there's another man in his parka that's, that's got stuck in the net, you know? And he's just stuck like that. Oh, can you, can you let me out? Please help me, you know? And so then he lets the man out, but then realizes that was actually a, a seal. That was a seal man. And just because that seal wanted that help. That seal allowed itself to be seen in human form. It's great. That's uh, uh, on the left. That's uh, one of the characters like that. It's uh, Ukpik. He transformed from uh, owl to the person. It's kind of he owls in a new pick. It's like wisdom. But the process is the same, creating them also based on the Arctic dolls and masks and real people, and it's like the image, the kind of the sketch of him, and that's how he looks in the game. And that's the people that I said, little people, the people that the story that we heard from uh, kids, and then we start to ask all the other people, and they, they really like it seems like believable because like I ask. Uh, the lady, she was like around 55 and tell me the story how she'd been chased by the little people and I like started asking like more like tell me like how, how big they are and she's like like that like are they dark how are they fur what what they wear they wear traditional clothing and I like maybe you mistake maybe it was a dog no it was little people I, like, it's really hard to understand 
where is truth, where is not, but everybody talks about that, uh, about like their presence. So they live somewhere, and like they actually live um, underground, and they're coming out, and they steal things. They're kind of a leprechauns in a new pack world. They're very strong too. They can lift the caribou and can lift like big rocks like that. And that's how they look in the game. Them stealing drum. So like, now I would like to talk about world uh, of spirits. And that's kind of probably was one of the most challenging things for us to do. Because world of spirits, at the very beginning, we designed the game that way. So like you can go... You can be in real world, and then you can go in a spirit world. And it, our designers really wanted to have the button there that you can press and go in one world, and then press the button and then go to another one. And they wanted to have this control, controlling these two words, roles. And it was compelling design, and it, was, it worked. But when we show it to the community and uh, to Alaska <laughs> guys, and they, we like, we like that, what do you guys think? And, they, and they're like, like, listen and look at us, and they're like, you know... It's not that easy. It's no button in the world that we can press and go from one world to another. It's not on demand. It's something, it's a one world where it's like spirit and real world, they believe it coexist in one place. And uh, to see them, you need to earn it. You need to kind of be good. You need to be a good hunter. You need to respect the community. You can't really press the button. It's just give them the, the wrong feelings. And we're like, Okay, that, that means we need to change things. And uh, that's actually one of the examples how we work with the community. They, because of that kind of conversations or the advice is we need to change the design. And that's not just to change one image. It's just change our thinking, how we think about the world. And it, that's, that's a big deal. And uh, I want to like, that's one of the most inspirational. I really like uh, you to hear about Sila from the uh, community because it's very interesting and very spiritual video. Silla is the weather. It also means the atmosphere. Here's the Nuna or the land. And it's anything from the land into the moon, the sun, the stars. That's Silla. It's, uh, it's a very spiritual, and we have a relationship with Silla. Uh, Silla has a soul in the same way we do as people, in the same way animals do. I think spirit helpers in and of themselves are really about how we're connected with things. And so it may be that there is a spirit helper that shows themselves as a bird to show you the way home. Or it may be a spirit helper that actually decides to show themselves with the face and body of a man instead of their animal form. And so I think one of the things that's hard to understand is that it's not one way of seeing things. It's one way of knowing you're connected to everything. We've always had that spirituality of everything around us. It's the interaction you have with the air you breathe, the, the ocean that you gather resources from, the rivers from which you gather fish, the tundra from which you pick berries, the animals that give themselves. It's, it's all, of, all of that. It's beautiful. So, like, uh, how we develop the spirits visually, it's also, like, inspired by the art. That's, like, one of the examples. And I will show you the image that I drew, like, for the, like, one of the sketches for our spirits in the game. And that's how they look in the game. It's very important, not just how visually, but also how they move, move in the world, like, very slow, kind of dreamlike moving. That's another example of spirits, quick sketches I did, like, but important to have, like, they're not a, just a platform. It's something livable, something lives in this world. And that's how they look in the game already. I'll go a little faster, but look, that's another example of them. Um, what you see right now here is... Uh, Scrimshaw. Scrimshaw, like lots of people like really like how the way how we did like 2D animation to, to, to tell this story. But I wanted to tell you how that happened. What Scrimshaw is, it's a 
very beautiful form of art, traditional form of, form of, form of art um, for Inupics. And it's one of the ways they tell the story and pass the story from generation to generation. So they carve on baleen or ivory. And when we saw this piece in Anchorage Museum, it kind of caught our attention, looked like, like by just looking at that, it feels like it's some kind of a story there, something going on. And we're like, we, we're like, why not to tell the story that way? Why not to take that kind of a quality of the screenshot and tell the story? And uh, I remember like I was, of, when we were flying on the plane, I did like really quick drawings, like a storyboard, what we can do. And then we develop this uh, kind of style for that, so as you can animate, and uh, our talented animator, and Fanny, kind of breathe the life into them, and we create uh, their screenshots. So what I wanted to tell you uh, about the importance of the inclusive development, like that's me wearing the su uh, snow goggles. But this image is just, I like that, but like it's not, it's kind of a symbolic image for us because that's what, when we put these glasses on, we're trying to pretend that we, we are in Upix, like what, trying to understand what they see, how they see the world. That's very kind of a, the whole process. The whole process, not us, we have the idea, let's do that. The process is what they see and how to share what they see with the rest of the world. So without this kind of a work, we wouldn't be able to achieve what we achieved. Like we wouldn't be ach to achieve the authentic, the, the look of the game that we, and, and the most important, authentic the look, the look that represents the people who live there. I wanted to say that uh, we, we got like, we blown away by the reception, like we nominated so many awards. Uh, we like BAFTA the next week, like today, we, game, uh, games award is here and um, DICE award. But like uh, the most important thing, we also were like in a many, many publications, but the most important is the reception from the community. And that's something that really touched us and moved us. Because when people see the game, they really feel that that's the game about them. That's the game that represents them. And that was the goal. I want you to hear what this young gentleman, we met, we met with him in um, Anchorage during the uh, Youth and Elders Conference. Um, and I want you to hear what he said. As soon as I heard the native words, I'm like, man, holy cow. A slice of culture. This is cool. And 25-year-old Winston Gregory was instantly connected. See, this is the way I want to teach right here. Exactly this way right here. It's really nice. It uh, makes, me be, makes me feel happy to be a uh, native. Marty Glazer, Channel 2 News. So what he just said, he said, it makes me be happy. Uh, it makes me happy to be a native. It's very powerful if somebody actually happy to be who he is and uh, actually be proud of their culture. And I, I think we couldn't ask more. That as a result, I think we achieved everything what we wanted to achieve. We made some people happy. And I think I'm satisfied with all this. And we want to make more games. And we want to make more happy people. I wanted to say Kayena, and I wanted to say thank you, everyone, for being here and listening to us. Good job.